Welcome back, adventurers. I'm your host, R.R. Slugger, and our journey through India has finally reached an end. We have arrived at set 7418 Scorpion Palace. Johnny Thunder and Dr. Kilroy have returned once again, though it looks like the doctor has changed his pants since his run-in with Tigura. It's a shame that neither Miss Pippin Reed nor Bablu were included in the box, though I see no reason to dismiss them from adventuring with us today. Sam Sinister is up to no good again, but this time he's enlisted some cohorts. The Scorpion Palace is protected by two stoic minifigures, the Palace Guard and the Maharaja Lalu. While the guard is likely meant to represent a generic soldier with a notable set exclusive torso, the title Maharaja is indicative of a great ruler of India. According to many descriptions though, this ruler may not be so great. His minifigure, however, is. Similarly sporting a set exclusive torso, the Maharaja also contains many other noteworthy pieces. For example, this was the very first time dark orange hips and legs were featured on a minifigure, and they would continue to be quite the rarity for the next 15 years. Likewise, the white turban was also a first, and to date has only been reused once, on a brilliant mini doll I might add. Finally, I wanted to share a subtle observation I've made concerning these figures' face prints. Both head designs were reused many times up until 2009, but the Maharaja's grey beard saw some change over this period. Bricklink doesn't account for this, but in 2004 the legacy dark grey colour was replaced with dark bluish grey, and as such, the Maharaja's beard printing was affected. Technically, that means this version of the face print is exclusive to this set as well. Altogether, this is an impressive array of characters, even if we had to leave a couple waiting in the wings. A large variety of accessories are included for our minifigures to wield, and even though most are rather typical, there are a few more noteworthy ones. Starting with the map that led us here in the first place, this printed 2x2 tile is one of three we'll see included within the series. When the trio are fully aligned, they'll lead the gang straight to the Golden Dragon which awaits them. I'll be honest though, compared to the map pieces we've seen in previous Adventurers sub-themes, I think the print quality here is laughable. Linking the maps together is a nice feature, but I can't help but criticize the graphic design work when we've seen so much better. The scimitar mold is one we've seen before in this series, and it's worth noting that the light grey and yellow versions included here are exclusive to the Orient Expedition. While the Maharaja is content to wield this blade, the palace guard prefers to stand with a polearm, creating a glaive by pairing the sword with an exceptionally rare brown bar piece. Both of these weapons would have been status symbols in this era, likely adorned with valuable gemstones too. Within a similar vein, these set exclusive printed shields only add to the prestige. These shields, known as dolls, are traditionally decorated with paint and often hold both cultural and religious significance. Taken together, the Indian denizens within this set exude wealth and are significant inclusions in and of themselves. Another substantial addition is that of this light grey elephant, set exclusive to the Scorpion Palace. It utilizes the same articulation as the one included in the Elephant Caravan, but this one also features a hoda to ride within, appropriately adorned with a gemstone. Moreover, this hoda is built upon a set exclusive brown base piece and is topped with a nearly equally rare red dish. Elevated canopies like this one were a choice of transportation for the wealthy. Even though Johnny and Dr. Kilroy are often depicted as the riders, it might make more sense for the Maharaja to possess this animal. Finally, we arrive at the Scorpion Palace itself. The large bulbous onion dome, flanked by two smaller decorated arches, alludes to the real-world Taj Mahal, and I don't think this is accidental. Throughout the Orient Expedition, there are a number of cultural elements that have been adapted into LEGO, and I feel the Scorpion Palace here is no different. Spread across two separate bright green base plates, despite its size and grandeur, this model is admittedly a facade. Not to downplay the iniquity of this set, but there's a reason nearly every single photo of this model is from one specific angle. 
However, I will say that Amid the Limited Interior Detail is an example of clever design language hidden within. These tile pieces along the edge of the base plate appear to serve no practical purpose, but I've always interpreted them to imply that a wall exists here. Rather than using some prefabricated wall pieces that block access to these areas, I think the set designers found a happy medium where builders could use their imagination to fill in the rest. Similarly, these small three-piece bushes add a sense of greenery to the whole affair without having to hang vines off of every nook and cranny. This model feels like it's lost deep in a jungle. I love this approach to set design. Not everything built out of LEGO has to be taken at face value. At the base of the building, we find the titular scorpion for which the palace is named. The slender claws sport a brilliant reuse of a mold created for the Zalax racers, here recolored in black. They're also affixed using a brand new piece for 2003. This one is molded in dark grey plastic, making this yet another example of the unique place in LEGO's history that the Orient Expedition occupies. By 2004, these would switch over to the new grey colours we still have today. Within the scorpion's grasp is a treasure chest, potentially full of gems like the two red ones that make up its eyes. If our adventurers want to secure the treasure for themselves, well, they may be in for a nasty surprise. Opening the pinchers drops a large dark grey boulder onto the unsuspecting quarry. This mechanism is all operated by string and elastics and functions smoothly enough, though the tail of the scorpion can be an inconvenience when trying to display the model on a shelf. If our heroes are able to avoid the trap, they can secure a whopping four gemstones within the chest, one of each color. All of this makes for an effective centerpiece to this model, but we're not done yet. There's still one artifact that's eluding us. Climbing to the top of the palace, we can find the Golden Shield, tucked away inside the Onion Dome. While it may seem silly to not incorporate the shield as a reward for avoiding the scorpion trap earlier, I think this makes a lot of sense from an in-universe perspective. The treasure visible from the exterior is simply bait. Even if the boulder doesn't manage to dispatch looters on its own, hopefully taking home a chest full of gems will keep them from exploring further. The golden shield rests atop a pedestal adorned with yet another red gemstone. That makes eight total from this set alone. The LEGO group was pulling out all the stops on this one. Speaking of which, pulling out this stop sends any would-be plunderer into the grips of the scorpion below. One final booby trap. The Scorpion Palace is a fantastic, fun addition to the adventurer's repertoire. While its construction is somewhat stunted by several concessions typical of this era of LEGO, I believe that this set is greater than the sum of its parts. Parts, by the way, that are still remarkably noteworthy. I tried my best to account for most of them, but there are still a number of unique or rare inclusions that I glossed over in the interest of time. The history behind the Onion Dome piece is also fascinating, but I think I'll save that for another video. For now, let's see what else we can build with these pieces by taking a look at the alternate builds. The first of the pair initially reminded me of the Pantheon in Rome, but it's likely more indicative of Rajput architecture common in India. The perimeter of columns and arches bears similarity to several Indian tombs and mausoleums, but the Maharaja Lalu isn't among the dead. At least, not yet anyways. There was definitely a bit of guesswork that went into building the rear section of this model, but I noticed what looked like a throne in the back, leading me to suspect that this may be some sort of forum where the Maharaja can rule over his people. The golden shield is proudly displayed in the open, a symbol of Lalu's power. However, such hoarding of wealth breeds dissidents, and it seems like there may have been a plan set in place to dispatch the Maharaja and make it look like an accident. At least, that's one interpretation of this model. The second alternate build towers over the first, using every single dark orange column piece included to construct an imposing spire. Within the tower rests a familiar boulder held perfectly in place using the concave section of the dome. Extending downwards are the two flexible tube pieces, creating a track and potentially spelling doom for any who stand in the way. At the bottom rests a treasure chest on a pedestal. It may appear unguarded, but it's far from helpless. Once the boulder starts rolling, it obliterates anything in its path, including the chest itself. 
When I first tested this play feature, I was unprepared for how brutal the destruction would be. The chest was completely blown apart, scattering gemstones across my living room. Hardcore. In keeping with the last model, there was also some guesswork on my part with a few sections of this build as well. Most of it should be fairly accurate, but the placement of some items may be slightly off. Of the two, I think I preferred the first one, though the play feature of the second one truly caught me by surprise. I think it goes to show that with the wealth of columns and arches this set provides, you can build a variety of awesome structures. We're just about ready to dive into the board game, but before we do, let's talk about accessories, and I don't mean for minifigures. Uniquely, in some regions, the Scorpion Palace set was packaged with this foam sword, modeled after the ones held by the characters within. Even though this was the only set in the series to be bundled with such an item, the LEGO Group actually made several foam products for the Orient Expedition line to be sold at Legoland locations. Brian's Bricks provided me with a photo of his collection, and I'd recommend anyone go check out his videos on this theme too. With the bricks behind us for the time being, let's get into the board game. Instead of going through all 21 cards one by one, let's look at them as we play, as they will all surely make an appearance. First off, the basics. The Orient Expedition board game is designed to incorporate the toys into the board game itself. The characters you play as, the items you collect, and the challenges you overcome are all derived from the sets themselves, utilizing the pieces and cards contained within. The object of the game is to gather useful tools, bypass skill challenges, and acquire the Golden Shield. The player with the most points when the shield is returned to the trophy square wins the game. The play surface is created using the seven included puzzle piece boards, arranged according to the manual. Of course, they are created to be interconnected in many orientations, but for this first game, we're going to play it as close to the letter of the law as possible. In our second run through, we'll attempt to make some tweaks to the gameplay based on our initial impressions. For now, this is the setup the instruction manual suggests. We'll be playing with three players, and even though the Scorpion Palace itself only contains enough materials for two, we'll borrow Pippin from the Elephant Caravan. I'll try my best to explain the rules as we go along, but without further delay, let's get rolling. Each character moves about the game board by rolling a six-sided die and adding their total speed skill to the die roll. Because Pippin has a plus three in that department, predictably she takes off from the starting zone and begins collecting items with Johnny hot on her heels. Being the slowest character, Dr. Kilroy legs behind, only able to collect the leftover scraps. Before he's able to, however, he rolls a hook, which takes the place of a six on this die. Rolling a hook ends your move before it begins, and Sam Sinister takes this opportunity to ambush you. Since he came prepared with a pistol, it would be unwise to challenge Sam's strength skill. Instead, Dr. Kilroy opts for a battle of luck, where they are evenly matched. A roll-off commences, with the highest roll determining the victor. Rolling a hook or any result that leads to a tie causes a re-roll to occur. This adds a degree of tedium to the exchange that will hopefully be remedied when we offer up our own suggestions on how to improve the experience later on. For now, Dr. Kilroy is victorious, and as such can steal the revolver from Lord Sinister upon his defeat. Sam is sent back to the sidelines to reappear when his number is rolled again. Correctly identifying its immense value, Miss Pippin Reed is able to use her incredible move speed to nab the backpack before anyone else can. Unlike the Time Cruisers board game, this game has much more rigid rules regarding how many items your character can hold. The intention seems to be a limit of one in each hand, with the backpack serving as the only way to expand this. Johnny will have to settle for some of the lesser items in the meantime. Despite only a handful of turns having transpired, the game board is already noticeably barren. Left with little options, Dr. Kilroy decides to grab this leftover shovel and make a play for the Scorpion Palace. But first, he's gonna need that elephant. During this time, Pippin has picked a fight with a palace guard, but easily bests him in a test of luck. By the way, the rules don't specify what happens to the villains when they're defeated, so we decided to remove them from the game board. 
Even though she only wanted to skirt past him towards the other side of the palace, the wording in the rules seems to imply that she has no choice in the matter. She instantly moves on to the scorpion statue challenge on her next turn. This prescriptive language is something we would rectify in our redesign later. Unfortunately, Miss Reed is ill-prepared for this challenge, and even though you don't roll for challenges the way you do for villains, she is unsuccessful in her encounter. Losing any skill contest, whether it be in a challenge or with a villain, causes you to drop one of your carried items onto an empty item space. Pippin discards her glaive that she pilfered from the guard last round, though it drops well within reach for her next turn. Johnny makes a run for it, but comes up short. No matter, he set his eyes on a new prize on the other side of the palace. The map would allow him to bypass the Scorpion Statue challenge entirely, leaving the jewels in its grasp all for him. After dusting herself off, Pippin sees it too, and the race is on. Dr. Kilroy uses his luck to successfully clamber aboard the elephant and secure the game's only transport. Should he wish, he can now move faster than any other player, advancing via game board pieces rather than merely squares. With that being said, the doctor has something else in mind. Using the elephant to bypass the challenge at the balcony, Dr. Kilroy now comes face to face with the Maharaja Lalu. To be honest though, we had a lot of trouble trying to determine exactly when the Maharaja is supposed to make contact with the player. Is it before the balcony challenge? After? During? The instructions are rather vague, so we just had to make an educated guess. Once again, Pippin was able to beat Johnny to their mutual destination. Using the glaive acquired earlier, she is able to bypass this, uh, carpet challenge? It isn't stated anywhere in the rules, but we felt it played best if items used to bypass challenges had to be left behind within said challenge. It goes against every fiber of my HeroScape trained brain to do something that isn't stated explicitly in the rules, but when Dr. Kilroy uses his shovel to bypass this trap door challenge, it makes sense to leave it there, right? Otherwise he'd fall. Since Pippin grabbed the map, Johnny will have to settle for this nifty revolver as a consolation prize. Pippin then returns to the final challenge left out on the board and uses the map in a clever way to stop the boulder from reaching her. The card doesn't specify how the map is to be used here, but I like this truly Lego solution to the problem. Now she is able to load up her backpack with gems. At this point, Miss Pippin Reed has won the game, though it's not official yet. The Golden Shield hasn't even been acquired. However, with the way the endgame scoring works, even with the Golden Shield, no player can possibly catch her score advantage. That's not going to stop Dr. Kilroy from trying, though. Abandoning his pistol, the doctor grabs the coveted Golden Shield as well as the gem above it and makes his way back to his elephant. Technically, the game isn't over until the central treasure is returned to this space, so he must endeavor to do so before we can tally the score. Johnny Thunder is in a pickle though. With the entire board clear of challenges and meaningful items, there's nothing left for him to do but wait around and lose. He's essentially entered a fail state that cannot be resolved and must continue playing even though it's impossible to win. Johnny isn't playing a board game, he's playing a game bored. This, in my opinion, is a cardinal sin of poor game design and should be avoided at all costs by developers. While re-rolls and lose-a-turn mechanics are tedious and add little value to the flow of the gameplay, the end game of the Orient Expedition board game is non-existent as players just sit around and wait for the one with the shield to make the journey. Sam Sinister won't be able to stop them. Even if a hook is rolled, the plus five luck bonus from the shield itself all but ensures that a luck contest will be won by the player. Since there's no player to player combat in the base game, we simply wait for the inevitable. When Dr. Kilroy finally reaches the end, we begin to tally our final scores. Each item that a character is carrying at the time of the finale counts towards your score, adding their bonus value to your total. In addition, each gem is worth 4 points, meaning that Pippin's backpack full of them is worth a whopping 16 points, 20 if you include the backpack itself too. And you do! Dr. Kilroy was only able to waddle in with 9 points, even though he beat the most challenges and brought home the Golden Shield. Johnny Thunder managed a meeker 6 with his revolver and binoculars combo. 
At the end of the day, the player with the greatest speed, and perhaps more importantly, the backpack, won. The group I played with predicted this would happen right from the jump, though it deserves to be said we're all triple the recommended age for this game. As it stands, we found the stock version of this game to be fun at times, tedious at others, and altogether too vague or flawed in certain critical areas. However, we recognize that the bones for a great experience were there, it just needed some tweaking. We came up with a ton of ideas on how to improve this experience, and I'll try to mention the most significant ones here. First off, we had to unlink the speed skill from movement on the board. The number you roll is the number of spaces you move, full stop. It doesn't make any sense to have one of the three skills offer a passive benefit outside of challenges, so removing this advantage put players on a more even footing. Secondly, the meet or beat principle can help curtail the tedium of rerolls and ties. In addition, we wanted the hook side of the die to play a bigger part in more situations when you need to roll. What we settled on was the idea that if you roll a hook when attempting to fight a villain, you automatically lose the encounter, essentially a critical failure. This change solved two problems. It eliminated a tedious reroll scenario and instead added some real weight to every engagement as there was always the risk of losing no matter how decked out the player was. This also made Sam Sinister a threat in mid and late game, whereas previously a player with even a single strong item could make short work of him. We didn't extend the auto failure of the hook to rolling for challenges, but I honestly think we could have and might even do so when we reach Mount Everest. We also felt the board size and item count was rather restrictive, as with just three players, we left it bone dry. Doubling the board size and adding a plethora of additional items in well-chosen places allowed the game to truly stretch its legs. Tigura's Roar and the Elephant Caravan sets were also integrated, though I'd like to note that the rules as written give zero indication as to how you're supposed to do this. <laughs> Ultimately, we went with what worked for us. With a larger playscape and more items to fight over, we also strongly felt that player versus player combat was missing from the original. Understandably, I could see kids getting frustrated at getting their golden shield swiped by another player, but for us, this was the biggest drawback of our initial experience. Players could now fight each other the same way they fought villains, with ties favoring the aggressor. Obviously, opening the floodgates on this sort of gameplay element could lead to some degenerative strategies, so some restrictions would likely have to be put in place. We played with a few ideas, but nothing was playtested to the point of being worthy for codification. You'll have to use your best judgment if you adopt our rules. This newfound conflict between players extended to an additional function of the hook side of the die. When rolling for movement and a hook is the result, Sam Sinister appears just like he did in the original. However, after battling with him, win or lose, the player can then move one of the other previously defeated villains onto an empty item space, potentially blocking other players from advancing. This functions very similarly to moving the robber in Settlers of Catan, and made for a fun secondary addition to the game. Now, even missing a turn by rolling a hook had some tangible effect on the game state of the board. Since treasure could now be fought over, we decided to repurpose the trophy spaces into being drop-off points. Until you're able to deposit your loot at these locations, you're vulnerable to lose it to either the villains or other players. Once you arrive at a trophy space, you can store any jewels you may have acquired off with your character card to be counted towards your final score at the end. Making the journey all the way back to these areas might seem like too much of a trek to be worth it, but we found the added sense of danger behind our new hook rules and player-to-player -player combat was more than enough incentive to want to protect our precious cargo throughout the game. In addition, we also decided to award players with a gem every time they beat or bypassed a challenge if they were the first player to do so. This made obstacles like Tigura's Roar more enticing to surmount, as you could first receive a gem for beating the floor plank trap, then grab the sunstone by defeating Tigura. The only challenges we omitted from this new rule were the transport cards, the scorpion statue, and the trap door at the top of the spire, as they were already linked to external rewards. 
The backpack itself presented a major issue initially, as it's truly the item that wins you the game. We toyed with the idea of having each player start with one, but instead decided that it might be more interesting to place them in key locations across the board, ensuring every player would have the opportunity to acquire one, but also making them more interesting strategically. We also opted to rule that you could store up to two gems inside the backpack piece itself, though these could still be stolen by other players. We were tempted to reduce the value of each gem to only two or three points, but felt that they essentially have to remain at four in order to be more valuable than many of the items already on the board. Why hoard gems if they're worth less than the revolvers scattered about that can also win you challenges? Because we added so many new gems into the mix, doubling the value of the golden shield itself made sense and played exactly as we wanted it to. From its pedestal to the final trophy space, all three players had their hands on the shield at one point in time as it was contested and fought over. In the end, the final scores reflected a much closer game and the experience of playing it was improved immensely. We're looking forward to playing again when we reach the Temple of Mount Everest. So that's the Scorpion Palace and the finale of our first leg of this adventure. This video was massive, but I wanna thank you for being patient while I cooked it up. Before we move on to Everest, I wanna do a quick recap video covering the journey so far. I hope to see you there. I've been your host, RR Slugger, and I'll see you next time for another adventure. <laughs>